Um, and I'll just kick things off with a brief introduction. I'm Jason West. I'm the senior judge of this session, uh, joined by a few other supporting judges. Um, their oversight will guide a lot of our, our participation here today. So welcome to um, IBESCC. We're glad to have everyone here. Um, brief overview, and I'll follow Cleo's directions. I, we're, we're a blind judging panel here, so I won't say where I'm located, what school, past affiliations, high-level overview. Um, I run a market research firm uh, rooted in qualitative research, and student presenters, you're in good company. I'm also a student as well. This old guy went back to school, so I'm in the middle of a doctoral program right now, um, so I, I understand your, your constraints and your time challenges too. It's a lot of balls in the year for me, but this is my sixth year as a judge uh, with this competition. And I can tell you, I learn as much from all of your presentations as, as you probably do working on it as well. So it's a pleasure to have you join and I will pass it off to um, Elizabeth uh, for an introduction, please. Hi, uh, my name is Liz. I am, Liz. Oh, I was, I, you know, I, 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 it's Liz. always, it's a formal on there. I'm very much- It looks so formal, I know. We're, in, all, we're amongst friends. <laughs> so um, I am a uh, marketing professional and uh, there's a lot of AI and other kind of ethics and concerns that affect my day-to-day -day workload. So I am thrilled to hear um, this presentation as it is a passion area. And I know that you're going to do a great job. Miriam? Yes. Hello, everyone. So uh, great to be here today. And uh, just a little background about myself. I have about 20 years in financial services. I have about four years of corporate innovation um, and leadership there. And I uh, owned a HR firm uh, recently up until last year. And currently, I am doing HR and finance consulting currently. Um, this is my third year participating. I'm always excited. I look, really look forward to hearing your presentations and how much uh, I know how much effort that takes. So I uh, really appreciate being here. Um, look forward to um, hearing more about your thoughts and, and where you took this project. And, you know, I think this is such a relevant topic. So I'm um, looking forward to it. Last but not least, Brandon, one of our other judges here. Good morning. Um, thank you very much. I'm, uh, I have a background in um, digital media. I have a podcast and public radio show on the future of science and technology. Um, and so we've been covering artificial intelligence for about 15 years in Southern California. And so I'm really excited to hear uh, the contribution that this team is making to the discourse. Great. Great. Well, thank you for those intros. Now I'm going to read just some few opening comments um, for the team presenters. Better understand, level set uh, the process here today. Now, in this part of the competition, you're taking on a fictional business identity and assigning a fictional business identity to us, the judges. So please make sure everyone here knows who you are before we begin your presentation. You'll have 25 minutes to describe the legal, financial, and ethical dimensions of the problem and to recommend a solution that passes muster on all three of those accounts. During this time, you get to present uninterrupted after those 25 minutes and I'll chat, if you keep the chat open, I usually like to give just a five minute countdown just to uh, give an alert to your teammates. When you're finished, we'll ask you questions for about 10 to 15 minutes. And during that Q and A, both yourself and us as judges stay in character. So the character that you have assigned to us. After the Q and A, you get to take, take a deep breath and we give you feedback outside the role playing, answer any questions that you may have about your presentation. Pretty straightforward process, but do want to just have you take that first breath now. Just you know you've worked really hard for this moment here today. So just know you're in good company. We're eager to hear your presentation and I will pass it off to you now. All right, so um, our presentation is on developing unbiased AI with a focus on Google's current situation. Um, so next slide, please. So currently, Gemini is Google's largest and most capable AI model. It's capable of working with and understanding text, image, audio, video, and code. It is also put in combination with Firebase and app development software and StudioBot and AI coding assistant. Um, that And Google plans to continue integrating and improving AI in a variety of use cases. 
with us with aspirations of accelerating scientific discovery, advancing healthcare, and building a useful quantum computer, amongst other goals. While they do have a strong set of principles that address bias, measures currently in play have missed the mark overall. Notably, the recent slip up with Gemini's image generation capabilities highlighted how thorough this process must be to get desirable re results. Simply integrating experts in diversity, equity, and inclusion into the development process won't solve the problem overall and may even make things worse if a strong system of checks and balances isn't in place. They have the framework to solve these problems. It's simply a matter of whether or not they're putting the necessary resources towards the correct things. So first to address this issue overall, we need to identify the forms of bias that may arise. So some, through some research um, that Chapman University did, we found that there are five major types of bias that occur in AI. The first being selection bias. This occurs when data, the data used to train a model isn't representative of the reality. This could be due to a lack of necessary data or misinformation in larger data sets. The second is confirmation bias. This occurs when a model is trained to rely too much on beliefs or trends. AI should be neutral in all possible ways. Relying on beliefs and trends ruins that. The third is measurement bias, which occurs when data collection doesn't align with the variables at play. This may come in a form of con a con convenience sample or any other statistical error. The fourth type is stereotyping bias, which occurs when AI reinforces stereotypes for a variety of reasons. And the final is outgroup homogeneity bias, which occurs when AI struggles with people who are outside of the majority. So now that we understand um, what, what types of bias there are, we now need to address where this bias arises. So for example, selection bias occurs during data collection and data preparations, as this is when data, the data used to train the model is selected and refined for use. Measurement bias occurs during data collection and data preparations as well. And this is when you're feeding the model that necessary information and this is critical when trying to avoid false conclusions or abuse of misleading correlations. Um, confirmation bias and outgroup homogeneity bias will occur during model development and model evaluation. This is the stage when developers choose how the model will treat the data and therefore whether or not the model will struggle with minorities and overvalue trends and opinions. And finally, stereotyping bias will occur during all stages of development. If data is reflective of real world, bi real world bias, data collection would be the first step towards reinforcing those stereotypes. Data preparation and model development then come into play as stereotypes may be ignored or reinforced for the sake of advancing the development process or utilizing larger data sets. And model evaluation becomes an issue because it can be difficult to provide the right amount of feedback to, to the model. So now our solutions look to cover all stages of the development process, beginning with data curation. This process would require the company to fill more positions focused on data selection and data preparation. They currently employ people with similar roles, but the process is lacking in depth as the company is still set on utilizing large data sets in hopes of advancing technology fast. The second step is creating a more comprehensive approach to evaluation. This would entail a more diverse set of individuals working on and evaluating a model before it's officially deployed. It would also require developing a system of checks and balances so no one person, group, or department has control over the model's results. The third step would occur after de model deployment and would involve, in, would it involve the users themselves. Feedback should be accessible and have an actual impact on the model. It shouldn't be lacking in depth either. Google should also be reaching out to those affected by bias in their AI and seek their advice. Okay, so the financial risks of biased AI. So the effectiveness of Google's Gemini um, are, and adoption are crucial for Google's continued dominance in AI and search technologies. The way in which Google will grow is by increasing the user base and deterring customers from using the competition. The way in which Google will do this is by instilling trust as trust has been described as a currency in the digital age. One of the ways in which trust can be diminished is by AI biases eroding that. Eroding the trust will lead to a decrease in user engagement, which does affect Google's plan of a premium model. With plans to integrate Gemini into Google's suite of services, which has largely been adopted by regular citizens, students and companies and schools, um, any perceived amount of bias or untrustworthiness will deter users from subscribing to a premium service, which does affect Google's revenue streams. So 
trust in the banking system is at a serious risk from the aforementioned biases displayed in AI, given that an example is that AI charge higher rates to Black and Latinx mortgage customers when compared to white ones. This is an example of when bias in AI has truly cost people extra money and has decreased their overall quality of life. If a bank or mortgage lender were to not use the Google service based off of bias or the communities being discriminated against were to decide to file a lawsuit, this could cause a significant backlash and could, and could lead to a decrease in search traffic, which would directly affect ad revenue. Re revenue from ads is Google happens to be one of Google's largest source of incomes. And if advertisers were to start to pull out of pull out of that due to AI's biases, that is a reduction in income. Over the long term, this could deter users from returning to the product, affecting Google's market valuation. So the path forward. Addressing AI biases requires a diverse and extensive set of data. However, these data sets can be costly and requiring a large amount of labor and time. However, it is essential for removing the bias in AI. The large scale effort to train the AI can provide more jobs. Google should have an easy, a very easy time affording the cost of training AI to be, to be unbiased as its parent company, Alphabet Incorporated, has had a market capitalization of up to $1.5 trillion in 2023. Google has also initiated various programs aimed at ensuring AI, AI fairness, including an AI ethics research grant and partnerships with academia to improve algorithmic fairness. However, we are suggesting that um, Google take these further in order to improve the revenue and is essential, and it is essential to make sure that these are done effectively. There's a clear lack of oversight from regu regulatory bodies. Businesses are looking for clarity from AI regulation so that they know they're not liable for any misuse or malpractice. Previously, companies were tasked with regulating themselves and setting their own rules to govern AI. This could risk repeating mistakes in history as we were wrong to allow companies to make their own rules for on online social media platforms. The absence of regulation allows companies to cut corners and we can see this with OpenAI, for example. OpenAI, as well as many other firms, have run into a common problem, the lack of material to further develop their AI models. As a result, they resorted to transcribing audio from YouTube videos with a speech recognition tool called Whisper. However, the company was aware that it might have gone against YouTube's guidelines as that it prohibits the use of its videos for applications independent of the video platform. The data was then used to release the newest form of ChatGPT called GPT-4. There are efforts underway to prevent this. For example, the US has proposed a, blu a blueprint for the AI Bill of Rights. It aims to build on existing labor practice laws to prevent bias in AI by promoting transparency and accountability. It emphasizes the importance of making sure that AI systems are fair and unbiased, particularly in areas such as hiring, lending, and criminal justice. Users should not face discrimination by algorithms and systems should be used and designed in an equitable way. The European Parliament has passed what is considered to be the world's first comprehensive legal framework for AI. The AI Act relies on a risk-based approach, which means that different requirements apply in accordance with the level of risk. While the focus of AI, of the AI Act is not explicitly to avoid uh, bias and discrimination, it introduces a number of mandatory requirements for high-risk AI systems, this can include risk management systems, data governance, technical documentation, and human oversight, as well as many others. We also have other ideas that you could consider. Uh, for example, extending the laws of copyright to training data sets. We could focus on preventing unfair use and unauthorized content creation, effectively just extending copyright rules. These regulations will require the company to be more mindful of the data they feed into AI, ensuring they cannot indiscriminately input all available information. Instead, the company would be forced to thoughtfully select and consider the data they use, which could help prevent bias in AI systems. We could also consider incorporating third-party audits. Um, for instance, New York City has implemented a new 
a new law requiring employers to not notify job applicants but notify job applicants of the use of AI to review applications and submit such systems to third party audits. It should also notify candidates, candidates that an automated system is being used. However, if we're going to use this, there has to be a clear baseline for AI auditing standards that could prevent companies from just hiring the cheapest third party auditor to check off requirements. So uh, the effects of um, ethical bias in real world scenarios. So Google has actually stated plans to take its Gemini even further and plans to implement it in other sectors of life, such as the judicial system, recruiting and hiring, and the healthcare system. So currently, AI is being used as a tool of risk assessment um, across the United States to predict future criminal behavior. Some of these are some of these uses are determining probation eligibility and treatment program eligibility. The conclusions that AA may draw will have a strong impact on the livelihoods of the people that they are sentencing. So for example, Dylan Fudget versus Bernard Parker. Um, despite repeated offensive, Fudget, a white male, was deemed low risk, while Parker, a black male, with no subsequent offenses, was considered high risk. And in Gregory Lugau versus Maui Williams, Lugau, with a history of DUI and, and battery offenses, was marked extremely unlikely to, to reoffend, contracting with Williams, who had fewer and less severe prior offenses, but received a higher risk score. These two cases relate to our sustainable development goals by um, addressing the inherent bias in AI to ensure fair treatment across all racial and ethnic groups and promoting equality within the justice system, as well as sustainable development goal number 10, which um, we aim to enhance the transparency and accountability of AI tools to build trust and inclusivity, um, ensuring access to justice for all. So the AI-driven systems that Google wishes to implement may wish to streamline HR processes and responsibilities, but the AI may amplify societal biases affecting minority groups disproportionately. For example, Amazon's AI tool favored male candidates over female candidates in technical roles. This revealed a bias in training algorithms trained on historically male-dominated sets. Um, AI-based video tool um, also um, may misinterpret cultural exp um, expressions of emotions, um, disadvantaging candidates from less expressive cultures, as well as targeted job ads algorith algorithmically skewed towards certain demographics, such as 85% women for cashier jobs and 75% um, black for taxi jobs, perpetuating existing employment stereotypes. The use of biases um, in AI um, pose hiring risks, pose hiring ethical risks and challenges the current legal frameworks demanding comprehensive solutions. Addressing AI biases and hiring practices is crucial for reducing inequalities within and across countries, ensuring fair and equal access to employment opportunities. And this is done by promoting the development and use of accountable transparent AI hiring tools, which, which would contribute to more inclusive societies. And in arguably one of the most important scenarios, Google has announced its plan to enter the healthcare market. And yet it's unchecked algorithmic bias um, risk perpetuating the discrimination against very vulnerable groups. Healthcare algorithms um, like others are trained and rely on biased data sources like insurance claims and health records and past trends. However, this may um, omit a certain information. For example, one algorithm, the Impact Pro algorithm, used healthcare costs as a proxy for health needs, inadvertently underestimating the complexity of health issues in Black patients due to socioeconomic disparities in healthcare access, as well as other algorithms um, trained predominantly with data from white patients fail to accurately diagnose conditions in patients of color, as seen in skin, skin lesion analysis, increasing risk of misdiagnosis and fatalities among people of color. And this relates to our number 10 sustainable development goal, reduce inequalities by eliminating disparities in healthcare and access and quality. And by mitigating all of these different scenarios, um, if Google were to take our advice of not having biased AI, they would be um, ahead of the market and ahead of other competitors, while also improving the quality of life of many different people being affected by this data. So for our approach, our ethical approach, 
we have three ethical priorities. The first being a comprehensive approach to evaluation. This would vary based on use case. For example, if AI were used to design healthcare, as Ian spoke of, doctors, public health workers, and all other relevant individuals would need to work closely with developers to create an effective model that improves efficiency without creating unnecessary inequities. Efficiency is obviously a priority for developers, as that is the purpose of AI, but it shouldn't be put above equitable results. Our second priority, our ethical, second ethical priority is prioritizing quality of data over quantity. Recently, Google, along with other leaders in AI, OpenAI, and Meta, have been flagged for ignoring corporate guidelines in order to harvest more data. This clearly shows that currently, quantity of data is high up on their list of priorities. We believe that models trained on carefully selected data are more sustainable long-term than the ones that utilize all available data for the sake of evolving quicker. Our third ethical priority is community outreach. This ensures this would involve utilizing user feedback and working with impacted communities to develop solutions that they feel are suitable. This would ensure that companies' ethics align with that of the community, which we believe is a critical step after the initial attempts to remove bias were deemed ineffective by many users. And now for the key takeaways. So taking a step back, we acknowledge that Google is a massive multinational corporation and has teams of people working on the exact issues we're speaking of today. We believe the issue arises from the fact that they're in what many consider an AI arms race. Competition often leads a company to push their principles to the side for the sake of beating out the competition. In this case, the top competitors are OpenAI and Meta. While there's no way to slow things down completely, we strongly believe that a carefully developed unbiased AI will not only win on the front of ethical quality, but also financially long-term. Biased AI is unsustainable and therefore laying the groundwork now will ultimately be what separates any company from the rest. Additionally, laws and guidelines regarding AI are developing at a fast rate and may lead to trouble for companies who haven't invested in unbi unbiased AI. Getting ahead of the curve will be great for the public perception of the company and success overall. Well done team. Uh, thank you for presenting to us as the Google developers. One of the first um, questions that kind of comes to mind for me, I'll kick things off and then pass it around to um, the other developers on the team here, is that focusing on the ethical considerations first here, and I appreciated that you really spent a lot of time highlighting um, those within the healthcare vertical, considering the diverse applications of AI across other sectors, um, how does your team plan to address any of the challenges that might arise when the tools are developed for let's just say, and apply to national security or public service or anything outside of healthcare, or do you think there's more potential misuse and ethical integrity involved with the healthcare sector? Hey. That's how you can go. Um, so I think we kind of focused on healthcare and like the judicial mm -hmm. system because those are two mm -hmm. examples we saw uh, really relevant and they mm -hmm. are applied right now, but we definitely think these applications would spread across industries. As I said, um, in one of my slides, I think it's just the, it's just a matter of working with professionals in every industry and not giving, um, certain individuals too much power over something, uh, for the sake of efficiency. I think we need to take our time working with each industry and focus on that rather than trying to create some AI that is just fast moving and has all these capabilities, but may not um, be suited well for every industry. I think you said public uh, services, mm -hmm. like for mm -hmm. example, I think it would be unfair to just like launch something that Google, Google may already have capabilities to um, work in that sector, but um, they probably aren't aren't launching that because of potential inequities they might create because they understand their um, their AI might have bias. Mm -hmm. 
And you did you did highlight specifically there was the bias that you kind of honed in on between between gender. Are there other in your research um, for this presentation? Were there other forms of discrimination in adapting AI systems for either our market in U.S. or global markets that you think down the line we will need to pay attention to as developers? Yeah, I mean, some of the examples that I came across in my like research, especially the ones with hiring, um, a lot of them came across in Europe, actually, with um, hiring and recruiting. And that was actually the example where the AI video um, tool, um, uh, it tended to, you know, discriminate since those people, it's, the cultures are very different, but they're also very close together. And then so you have a lot of people traveling, living in different places but they're actually very close by, but the mannerisms are very different. So I think that's also another important and interesting factor that you have to take in that AI has to work on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add to that. Um, I think with like uh, such diverse, uh, like diversity across the world and different cultures, um, AI may kind of try and tie things together and it may not understand cultural differences as well if it, with large data sets, it may be like confused by that and may qualify one culture um, as like superior because of certain qualities or because of trends in the past. And I think uh, that becomes an issue in hiring specifically because um, certain uh, cultural qualities may be undervalued by an AI simply because it sees certain trends that may not be applicable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'll open the discussion to, to our other developers on the team and questions that, that came to mind from mixed um, I, I, I had a, a question. Um, I noticed on what's important for us is that if we do the work to eliminate or reduce the bias, we wanna make sure that we can measure it. And I know on one of the slides you had mentioned that you wanted to bring the community in and have them assess it, but do you have um, kind of some concrete ways that we can measure whether the work that we're doing has the impact that we're intending? Um, I don't think we have specific numbers yet, but I think one of the examples that I'd cite is uh, recently with Gemini's image generation model, how they kind of had a slip up with their generating humans. So now that process is kind of stopped. So I think community, like user feedback and like um, is just gonna come into play and uh, like people will speak up if they see things that are wrong. And I think the company will need to react to that, which I think uh, simply just uh, in kind of uses as well, like usage numbers will go down if something is uh, extremely biased and they, they aren't liking their results. But other than that, I don't think I have uh, specific numbers uh, to measure it, but I think just involving the community is a great thing and listening to them a lot. Um, I'd also like to add on to Tyler's point. Um, I feel like Google should also emphasize on testing, testing on each and every kind of stage of development. I feel like uh, the recent incident with Gemini about the um, image generation process could have easily been prevented if they had just done rigorous testing. And a lot of your presentation kind of was that that uptick, the, the reasons why we need to consider this this proposal. What would you say? What is the the biggest reason or uh, what would be the biggest fallout for for the Google development team, if we decided we aren't going to accept this proposal and we aren't moving forward, what's what's the biggest drawback to not advancing these considerations? I think the biggest drawback would be that it, eventually bias would be into incorporated into AI and it would um, have like these huge kind of blow up in your face moments. And mm -hmm. essentially you'd, you'd lose business, you'd lose customers people would consider using AI from other companies that are more reliable, that basically don't have bias. If you neglect bias, I feel like you're just gonna add to controversy and that's just terrible for brand image as well. Mm -hmm. And it's also a chance to spread misinformation among 
you know, younger people, older people who may have a more specialized question that can't be answered by a straight, you know, search into a web browser, but can be answered by um, an AI, you know, conversational tool. And like, like we've seen like recent headlines that, you know, teachers are struggling with having their kids write essays because they're just putting their prompt into chat GPT or putting their prompt into another AI conversational tool. And then so, but if that by, if that, if that conversational tool is giving them biased information, then you're teaching young kids, you're teaching young adults, you're teaching people who are uninformed and don't know any different that biased and um, information that might not help them down the line. Mm -hmm. And Miriam, certainly, she's one of our core developers here. I mean, she's she's legacy at Google. She goes all the way back to Larry Page and Sergey Brin. So <laughs> Miriam, I'm sure you, you have something that you want to... Yeah, I, I guess um, one of the biggest concerns I have is potentially what are the governing bodies around this type mm -hmm. of development? And, you know, that's always the limit limitations in, in developing anything. So I guess there were mention of a, a couple of um, bodies that have, uh, you know, been involved, but I guess overall, like, is UNESCO involved? Is there like California Privacy Protection Agency involved. What are what are we up against, and what are some of the potential issues around compliance? And 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 I know you mentioned one other point. You know, separately is you know you don't want to have someone one agency taking over and having so much control because once they have control, that becomes a bigger issue as well as monopolizing this type of process or this type of new uh, technology. So. You know, referring to my first point is a question about uh, the oversight and compliance uh, aspect of it. And then the secondary part about it is, you know, in the end, there has to be a decision maker somewhere, you know, whether we gather information from the com uh, community or we we get other information and how do you really uh, clean the data before it gets in, like the garbage in, garbage out was a terminology used in my time. But, you know, that's that's part of the problem that you're addressing here. So um, hopefully, um, you know, you got my uh, question here. First of the governing uh, body uh, of compliance and then, you know, decision-making and who is involved with this data washing. Um, in terms of regulatory bodies, um, throughout my research, I've kept noticing like people have been proposing this and proposing to do that, but there hasn't really been any kind of set um, rule that at least across the US that has like forced companies to abide by a strict set of guidelines. But I also completely agree that just having one body um, kind of regulate this industry would definitely be, um, would be problematic. And in that sense, I'd also, go back to my point on like third party audits, having like independent companies um, kind of look into our company and making sure that making sure to like mitigate any bias the best that we could would be, um, I guess, what I would uh, consider. I'd also like to point out that we uh, read into the blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights, which is published by the White House on the White House's website. Um, I think it's a good kind of guideline. Uh, not all of it is like written into law, but it's kind of uh, an outline for development. And I think that's something that larger companies should be following now, because I think down the line, uh, there'll be more, more issues with uh, bias in AI law that come into play that they have kind of been ignoring now, because this is still a new thing, even though it's, it's been a while, it's been around for a while at this point, but um, like the controversies will arise later and it's better to avoid them now than um, uh, have them come up later. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In your research, is there any area where you found, we still need to know as developers even more, where you found, you know, where there's a little bit more to dig on, a little bit more to discover before we can make that, that concrete decision on whether to move forward or not with your proposal? One area I would look into is the actual process of development. 
Um, mm -hmm. None of us three are, are computer science majors. None of us are experts in machine learning or anything like that. I think mm -hmm. that's actually, a, that's obviously a major step of this is working with computer scientists, finding ways to um, mitigate bias in the actual process. Because in the end of the day, it's the, it's the computers that are outputting these bias results. And um, that's mm -hmm. something that you're going to have to look into in much more depth is um, the computer science side of things and how that will be applied to your company and uh, obviously how much that will cost um, and the impact will have overall. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any other questions from the developer team before we? I have one uh, question. I don't know if you can hear me, but um, my question is, you know, I have to admit that I, I haven't eliminated all the bias within myself. So I have to confess that it's a daily exercise to reduce the bias that I have within myself. And I'm wondering, you know, just from a, where the where the balance is between a group of of group of people who are working on eliminating all of their bias within ourselves, the developers at Google, and society at large, where a lot of the data on the internet is at the has been generated by humans who may have some kind of bias, um, and we take these two inputs, uh, people who are biased in the context of we're here at Google, um, and we're all working on our bias, and then the internet data at large. And we're outputting unbiased AI, and so I'm kind of just curious, you know, how do we actually eliminate the bias in AI if we still have some bias within us, and the internet certainly has a lot of bias in the data that's contained within it? How how does those two inputs equal? Um, um so. If I understood your question correctly, you're asking um, how can we produce an unbiased AI when humans themselves are naturally biased? Um, I guess my answer to that would be is that if you have a collection of people large enough and you go through these rigorous steps and processes, eventually you'll get to a product that can be as unbiased as you possibly can be. Um, I'd also imagine that when say an AI is like producing search results or answering questions, it should notify the user exactly where they're getting this information from and kind of um, you know, point them in a direction that, hey, by the way, this might be a bit biased because it's from the source. I think um, an example of this is a bit of touch, touchy subject, but that would be like politically biased text results. Um, when you're asking, when the user is like asking about like polarizing figures, it's hard to give information that's not biased. So I feel like the computer should be aware that, okay, this is not completely unbiased information and it should inform the user that don't take, don't take everything, you know, in face worth. Just wanted to um, add one comment just quickly, just because you know I um, hear what we're supposed to be doing to monitor and and go through this process. I have concerns about the time constraints around going through those processes. So maybe you could just mention a few things about how that time would be managed if we would go through those processes to develop. Um, I'd say this is one thing I noted was that um, a lot of jobs, as many of you know, a lot of jobs are going to be lost to automation. And I think those jobs need to be filled in other ways. And I think this is a great opportunity to create jobs um, for people who can uh, spend their time working out biases and working with diverse sets of people to cancel those things out. And I think that's going to be part of it is uh, moving people to new roles. Uh, and then the second part of it would just be um, on top of regular work, uh, just people from different sectors of the company working together um, on top of their current job to kind of consult these people that are um, going to become experts in the field of eliminating bias. So in terms of time, it will kind of come two ways. There's going to be some people with roles specifically to do this and that'll be their entire job. And then on top of that, there's gonna be people that um, their work may have to get reorganized in some ways, but um, it will kind of be on top of their current role.
Any other questions from, from the Google developers? I just have one more question. Um, I think you had mentioned that we could have kind of first mover advantage if we really lean into these steps to reduce the bias. But can have we seen, you know, with um, Meta or OpenAI that they're going in this direction? Have are there any early learnings from them? If so, um, so far, at least from OpenAI. All they've been doing is just asking the government to please, please regulate them, which is a very unique situation to be in because it's not really every day that you ask, that you see private companies asking for people to regulate them. Um, however, they're not very transparent about the ways that they, again, mitigate bias in their algorithm. Um, so to answer your question, I don't think there's much being done at the moment. Um, that we're aware of. Um, one thing I'll add is um, I, I recently read an article um, about Meta and they have this um, kind of variance reduction system that they are putting in play. It's not something Google has. And this is kind of a system that's supposed to reduce bias and um, kind of, as I said, kind of create more neutral results because mm -hmm. um, Obviously, we want AI to be something that's kind of a neutralizer. It, it doesn't just provide, isn't a tool for one side of an argument to use over the other. It should be something anyone can use. And I think reducing like uh, its uh, reliance on like strong opinions is something that uh, needs to be done. And that's something uh, Meta is doing right now, but uh, Google hasn't uh, fully employed yet. Well, thank you for your time to presenting to the Google development team. Uh, we appreciate that and uh, we will take your recommendations under consideration. And with that, we get to remove our, our hats and our characters for a moment. Um, well done team. Take a breath, uh, you, you got through this. We now shift into kind of our, our feedback loop. Any um, comments that we have as judges, any questions that you have as presenters? Um, I'll start things off with a comment. I was so impressed with how exceptionally well researched this was. You really went down the rabbit hole and had current figures to support your thoughts and your recommendations. And I think um, once you once you grow up and get older and, and you're in the business realm, you'll find that it, data points and data figures can be so compelling and to drive that consideration and to move it move it forward. It explains the why and your presentation was just so rich with those details and really helped to build your case. Um, so I, and I also appreciated that you had a uniform deck. Um, we, I don't always see that as a judge and I think it really helps to build a cohesiveness, especially in these panels that are online. Um, some are in person, we're seeing the teams in person, others simply have that online. So it brings you together as a team. And I also, I like lists of three, so I'll round out with a third and before I pass it off to the other judges, is that you were able to piggyback. You knew each other's content. You weren't so insular and myopic in only studying and only knowing. I only did ethics, so I don't really know. You were able to layer in and say, well, let me add to Tyler what he was saying and vice versa. And I think that really presents a cohesive team. Um, and you'll find that when you are presenting with your colleagues and you're able to complement each other and know that you, it, it says that you've worked together well as a team. So I think that really came off in spades in your presentation today. I agree. Everything <laughs> Jason said. One thing that I would recommend, um, and this is coming from just a um, marketing perspective, um, when you start off, I think you you want to start with a story, right, with a hook. And you kind of alluded to it that there was an issue recently with Google, but the idea that um, even though Miriam has been there since Sergey <laughs> has been there, you never know like how long, I mean, how much familiarity people have, even though they work at Google, it helps to kind of restate the story to get everyone on the same page. And that becomes mm -hmm. your hook to then build off of and for people to refer back to 
And that is, you know, kind of the underpinning, you know, we've got this conflict. We've got people who are involved in this conflict and this is the potential pain of it. And now we're going to help you be the hero to resolve the conflict with these very concrete ways. And then these are the benefits and the next steps. So it's more of just a structural thing in the way that you arrange it, but really thinking of it from a storytelling structure. You don't want to launch into all of your data up front, into all of the kind of terms and, um, and all of that will come, but you want to kind of set that foundation first. And I also agree with Jason. I like the fact that you were able to kind of add in that you proactively jumped in and said, you know, I'd also like to add, I also want to bring this up because it just fleshes out um, you know, and it allows each of you to have an area of expertise and a voice in the presentation. Yes, yeah, so um, I'd, I'd like to say that Jason captured a lot of my thoughts um, and I love that whole, whole part of marketing and that's a key part of presentation, but I would say the cohesiveness of the way that you work together really stood out for me because I think when you're a team, you know, you work in the corporate environment, that's really what it's all about is really working together with the other parts of the pieces and being able to understand it all. So it seemed as though you um, all, all of you had um, those really good connections. You learned a lot together and um, it was such a great topic um, and so relevant at this time. So um, I was very, you know, uh, very much drawn to the topic and um, was very curious to see what you had offered. So it was a good learning um, experience for me to hear what you had done um, and you presented really good information. So that was, uh, that was really helpful. Um, I'd say just as any suggestion, you know, there's always room for improvement. Um, I think that, um, well, um, I, I think generally what would have helped me because I have this financial really heavy financial side of me. Um, I like to see numbers pop out. Um, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more of that um, on the financial side of it. And then I would have maybe researched a little bit more about what are some of the larger organizations doing and how their impact was. Um, and maybe, I know you, you provided some legal um, cases on, maybe it wasn't legal, but it was examples of what was impacted through certain uh, research on the health side. Um, but there could be some larger cases going on. I'm not really sure, but um, some of the bigger names are, are definitely making efforts towards you know, this initiative because it's such a, um, it, it's such a worldwide impactful uh, topic. So um, just wanted to give you kudos overall. Um, great topic, um, great cohesiveness and um, like um, Jason and Elizabeth said, um, just everything else worked together well. Oh, and Ian, you hung in there, even though I could tell you might be catching a cold. So good job in hanging in mm -hmm. there. <laughs> Thank you. And that's true. That's life. You can't prevent <laughs> hiccups all the time, or you just have to like, you know, and I, especially now in our Zoom world, right, where you just can like, you know what, the dogs are barking, the doorbell rang, so it goes. Like you can't control, you know, sometimes. Every, not everything is in our control. Brandon, any feedback for our team? Absolutely. Um, I wanted to say I was really impressed with the way Maria answered uh, the question that I asked about how a biased group of Google developers could process biased data on the internet and generate an unbiased sort of organization or output in artificial intelligence. One of my comments about that just might be, I, I kind of wanted to uh, just sort of leak create a question where uh, a response could be, you know, one of the major goals of any organization under US law is to eliminate bias with respect to hiring of developers. And if Google were to reduce the bias in its developer community by hiring developers from all over the world, perhaps, given Google's unique uh, structure where employees have a certain amount of time on personal projects, the 20% rule, I'm not sure if they're still in this high interest rate environment, maybe Miriam knows, still uh, utilizing that sort of rule where all developers basically have some time for personal projects or, uh, you know, uh, selecting uh, projects of interest that it could be the case that since Google has unique financial resources, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars in cash, very, very basically no debt, 
that if it internally were to reduce the prioritization of some of the other bets in their annual report and internally among the developers self sort of selected uh, uh, projects, that the investment over the long term in uh, reducing bias would really dovetail with Google's investment in the Android ecosystem, where they basically um, have the most broad, you know, smartphone software developer ecosystem in the world. And there are developers in every country in the world, in Nigeria and India and all the developing countries where Google's user space is growing the fastest. So I guess um, the question could have been answered by touching on legal, uh, ethical and uh, business or financial components. It, it was very difficult, but um, I, I just would give that as a commentary. Thank you for your comment, definitely noted. And I wanted to add to something that Liz said has been percolating on my mind, and it's that that narrative and that storytelling aspect. And it's something as judges, part of our role here, it isn't to judge by the traditional term of it and be judgy, but to really just kind of see you in, in your youth, know that you're going to grow into presenting in the business world and to be able to master presentations in that sense. So I think having um, as much as you grow in your presentation skills, you also find that they become more conversational, that as you present slides, it isn't serious content to present, but you're like, you know, something interesting that, that's on this slide that I want to share with you. And it becomes that you're in a room and you feel that presence of sitting with peers in your audience, whether they're the C-suite of Fortune 100 companies, and I'm moving around a room and just kind of sitting around. It's not always so, this is the most serious thing I'm, I'm doing in the world. You'll find it's like, oh, like people want to learn from you and they'll, they'll turn to you and know that you're the expert and that you have a voice in the room and you have a seat at the table. I really like that Liz said that, that there's a story and an arc to just the more comfortable you get with the content that you are presenting. Um, really, it really just comes out so naturally that that helps the buy in, that helps them know that, that you're the consulting firm that they need to hire. Any questions that you may have? Teammates, anything that, that we can offer you? I know this is just one part of the round of this. this colossal effort of presentations and as you prepare or if you're part of the 10 second or the or the 10 minute or the 90 second or i have a quick question so mm -hmm. i'll be doing the 90 second presentation tomorrow mm -hmm. and uh with what liz said about like the storytelling part i know it's harder in a kind of an elevator pitch to like balance like kind of catching people's attention and giving them the information you want to give them mm -hmm. uh like i'd like to hear your opinions on how you would do that in a shorter type of presentation? Yeah, great. you know, it's a great question. And what's funny mm -hmm. is I actually just had a workshop with my team where we had we had two minutes mm -hmm. to get, you know, to the point of it. But I think what you want to do, you want to have that hook. You want to make it personal. You want to have some supporting arguments, which you already had in there. And then you want to have kind of the takeaway. Right. So what does this mean for me? What's the benefit for me? And what am I supposed to do? So starting off with, you know, there's a lot of bias in um, AI models right now. And that bias has, um, you know, we've seen it in the recent example of X, Y, and Z. It's important to get in front of these biases because there's a material impact that you can have on the bottom line. We understand that if people don't feel comfortable with these models, they just won't use them. And so today we want to talk about ways that you can improve your model. I want to give you, you know, two quick ones and uh, also want you to understand that there is a financial implication to this. And we have a step by step to help you tackle this issue, starting with blah, 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 whatever. And we believe that this will help put you in the forefront of the race for AI superiority or whatever it is, right? Have that really strong close. I don't know how long that was, but that's kind of how I would, you know, again, set it up with the story. This is the conflict. These are some examples. This is what you can do. And these are the benefits for you. Thank you. Great suggestion. I mean, I think even if there's like a data point that would speak to those, like the the legacy developers like Miriam, we're making we're making Miriam sound like she's 80 years old and she <laughs> the company back in the day. But that like the one data point that you like is the most aha catchy one that you're like, da 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 da. It's like, oh, I didn't know that. Like, what's the audience gonna be like? Oh, I didn't know that. I'm gonna lean in and now tell me more. 
Right. I mean, especially thinking that yeah. at, I think the number is between 90 and 92 percent of all Internet searches start with Google. Mm -hmm. Right. And so they have that dominance. But, you know, in this area, there are some other people kind of nipping at their heels. So if they want to maintain that dominance, they have to be proactive about this. And that first mover advantage, I think, will also play heavily in their favor, you know, because they'll get the benefit of the good press from that and the, the users adopting the, the model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're certainly your team is benefiting from digesting a topic that is is so current. I don't think there's a day that goes by that I'm not reading or discussing something about generative AI. And I think reminding those in the audience of how new it still is, that we haven't experienced this since, you know, it's like, what, 15 months ago? Prior to that, it's like, we weren't talking about it day to day to day. And so your your topic right now is, is really relevant. So I think it will. I just have one more suggestion. Um, what really helps, I think, make the impact is summarizing in a few bullets at the very end, your main points. And um, that really hits home because people get lost within a presentation. And especially me, I, I have a short-term memory at some point, but you know, having those few bullet points that are your strongest arguments on what you want them to take away, uh, simply put, I think is a, is a strong ending statement for any type of presentation. And remind me for the shorter versions that you were inquiring about, Tyler, are these presentation driven or these are more those those elevator pitches where you're on, you're just you're on and you're just speaking only. Yeah, I think it's no slide it's, reliance. It's like, no, it's just speaking just like 90 okay. seconds, like elevator pitch style. And the mm -hmm. 90 second one is focused on like the sustainability of it and okay. uh, like that aspect. And then I think we are. Ian and Maria are going to do the 10 minute one, which will focus on um, the ethical concerns more. Mm -hmm. right. Well, I think you you all are poised for success in the competition. So thank you again. Any any last minute questions from the judges? If not, yeah, we'll do we'll do real applause and just for just for kicks. Let's I'm doing the yeah. Uh, all up. Well done, and... Um...